and she is going to be talking to you about all kinds of exciting things today. So take it away, Carla. You've got 30 minutes, and I'll pop in to give you some last-minute warnings. Thank you, everyone, and happy to be here today. I have been asked to talk about our public education and outreach that we do around invasive species, particularly when we need to do an eradication. And so, um, you know, before this year, most of my work circled around gypsy moths, but this year, Asian giant hornets have taken over not only my life, but the lives of many people at the Department of Agriculture. So we are going to be talking today um, first about gypsy moth and then about Asian giant hornet and our outreach that we do to the public. So as I already mentioned, on the left here we have, that's a female gypsy moth, and on the right is Asian giant hornet. That photo is one of the brand new ones just from, I guess, last month at this point, but um, that's also a, a female Asian giant hornet worker. So starting with gypsy moths, a lot of people are familiar with gypsy moths, especially if you li lived back east, um, but a lot of people are not. So just a quick question or a quick summary, why are gypsy moths bad? First, um, the main reason is that it's an invasive pest that can defoliate entire forests. Um, they eat over 300 different types of, uh, of vegetation. And in 2016, there was an outbreak back east and the outbreak was so bad that the defoliation could be seen from space. So these have the potential to do devastating damage to the environment and our agriculture systems here in Washington state. Um, also, it's a public health nuisance. They have, you can get rashes. I've, I've had a rash from Asian giant, or excuse me, from gypsy moths, um, allergic reactions. And you have these wonderful um, caterpillar droppings where basically you get levels of pests that are so large that it's basically raining feces from the trees that you're under. So it sounds like rain, but it's not rain. Um, and then other envi environmental hazards from the damage that they cause in the um, in the environment by taking out the trees, you ha then have uh, you know cascading of other environmental effects. So my job, if this video will play, back when I was hired in 2015 to do gypsy moth outreach is to convince people, especially in Western Washington, where most of our uh, eradications take place, that having a plane flying over you, crop duster as most people like to call them, uh, we call them aerial applicators, of course, uh, spraying a, a BTK over you in Seattle or Tacoma or Renton, Linwood, anywhere, <laughs> is actually a good idea. So as you can imagine, that's kind of a hard sell, especially here in Western Washington with people who are not familiar with that um, type of thing. So we had a lot of concerns, especially in uh, just backing up, I was hired in 2015. We were gonna be doing a large eradication in 2018, excuse me, 2016, where we would be treating over 10,000 acres, which included a very large area in Tacoma and also Seattle. So um, we had a big uh, job ahead of us to try and um, get this eradication to go through. And there were some concerns right from the beginning. The last time we had the spray for gypsy moths in Seattle was back in 1999. There were widespread protests. There were lawsuits, uh, opposition from legislators and other municipal leaders, negative editorials in the newspaper. Um, and then for this year, we were concerned, or for that, at that time, we were concerned about the emerging threat of social media and things going viral in a negative way um, that might potentially derail our eradication efforts. So these were some of the concerns that we were trying to prevent with our education and outreach that we were starting in 2016. So we had to kind of take a look at how we were um, presenting our information and what strategies we were taking. The number one strategy was to be really clear about what we were doing, what our responsibilities were, and what types of actions we were taking. 
Um, making sure that messages were coordinated between um, not only WSDA, but as Justin just mentioned, a lot of the partners, for example, on the Invasive Species Council are also you know, very supportive of trying to manage gypsy moths in Washington state. And so making sure that we were all speaking from the same, uh, singing from the same song, same song sheet as it, as it is. Also, um, and this was a new one, using social media. Um, that's new, obviously, and but still using old methods of news media and working with our employees, that kind of thing. Keeping our stakeholders up to date and, of course, responding quickly to requests for information and misinformation. <laughs> so um, when I started, there was sort of a plan. There was an existing method in place, I'll put it that way, that they'd been doing for the agency had been doing for several years. Um, and so I kind of came in with a new perspective as a as a new employee and also someone who had worked extensively in social media. So we worked through some new ideas and also um, revamped some of our old um, existing practices. And then a big part of it that I didn't have to do, luckily, but my boss did, um, was prepare management for our new approach. And one of the one of the big challenges was social media. When I first started with the agency, we had social media pages, but they were very um, not managed very actively. And we, you know, we posted every once in a while, not very consistently. Um, and we definitely didn't talk about controversial issues on social media, um, such as spring Seattle and Tacoma with a pesticide. Um, I lobbied that we absolutely had to do that, that it was um, a, the conversation is happening out there on social media. That's where people are talking. And if we're not part of the conversation, they're only getting part of the story. Um, so that was a big change. And um, I didn't realize how much work um, my boss, Hector Castro, was doing to um, help that to happen. But they did in the end decide to go ahead and take that risk, allow us to go out and be proactive on social media. So we'll get back to some more social media stuff in a little bit. Um, some of our goals, make sure that there's widespread awareness of the Gypsy Moth Project. So I think sometimes in government agencies, if we have, or really in personal life even, <laughs> if we need to do something that may not be very popular, sometimes we try to you know, kind of get it in under the radar and try to draw as little attention as possible um, to it. However, you know, flying over a metropolitan city in an airplane and spraying something is not something you can really hide. Um, so we wanted to ensure from the beginning widespread awareness about what we were doing. Also to that end, really helping people understand the threat that Gypsy Moth poses to our state. And not only um, from the perspective of the Department of Agriculture, but the perspective of the people who are going to um, be in those eradication blocks so that they can understand the threat that is that they have as well. Another issue that we had was responding to fake news. And I'm gonna I have a whole little slide on that. Um, we, had, we had fake news before fake news was a thing. Um, and then our other goal was to provide real-time information about treatments. So when they're actually happening, how do we connect with people and let them know what's going on in the minute? Um, obviously, you can't do that with a mailer. So how do we do that? I want to talk in, in a little bit more depth about your audience and speaking to your audience. When I first um, got there, some of the messaging, it, and it's not bad messaging, it's just it had a different focus of talking about the potential impact to agriculture, which is important, but it's not so important to people in Seattle that are going to be sprayed with a pesticide. Um, so we had to take a step back and say, why do these people care? Why do people in Seattle care? This is the evergreen state. We have a lot of people that care about the environment. And so we really emphasize that angle. So you could lose your neighborhood trees, you know, your own backyard, you could um, lose that tree or you're, you know, sitting out there with your cup of coffee and caterpillar poop falling in it. Um, cost to homeowners if they have to manage this themselves as they do back east. Again, talking about that human health impact of caterpillars where a lot of people are actually directly allergic and have human health impacts from the caterpillars themselves. 
and then risk to the environment on a larger scale from your local parks to state parks and our, our national parks that we have here in Washington state that we're so proud of. We reduce the emphasis, and again, this is not eliminating it, but it's not our leading message to people in Seattle about the economic impacts to agriculture, the export impacts to agriculture. These are still important messages to particular audiences, but not the main audience that we were targeting in, uh, in Seattle and Tacoma, for example. Again, gypsy moth's a high, high risk threat to the environment. Uh, we, sp we spoke specifically about the products we're using, BTK. It's approved for organic agriculture and safe for humans, pets, and bees. A lot of people, when we said, uh, is it organic? They're like, oh, okay, no problem then. <laughs> um, reminding people that WSDA has been safely and effective, effectively eradicating the pest over four decades um, and letting people know that we wanted to hear from them. What did they have? Um, to say what are their ideas, what are their thoughts. Um, we wanted people to really felt heard. Even though we have, you know, we've been doing this for four decades, we have a really good idea of what we're doing, but we want to give people the opportunity to be heard. Um, one of our key messages the next year became BTK will stick to your car in outdoor services <laughs> because um, after everything was said and done in 2016, we sprayed 10,000 acres and, you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people. The number one complaint is that we didn't tell people that BTK was going to um, stick to their car and they'd have to wash their car. So now that's part of our key messaging <laughs> that, that people should know. BTK is going to stick to your car and it just washes off. Don't worry about it. No, we're not paying for your car wash. Some of the outreach that we do with uh, Gypsy Moth, we do, you know, the traditional outreach. We do pests. Uh, press, press releases. We have an updated website that has uh, is more user friendly and people can find basically anything that they need. We conduct meetings with government and other official stakeholders and we hold open houses. Um, In-person open houses are extremely poorly attended. It doesn't seem like it's worth the time, but when people push back, when it come, when you come to actually spraying and you can say, you were invited to an open house in your community where you could learn about this project and tell us your thoughts. Um, and that opportunity was there to have that input before the eradication actually happened. It cuts through a lot of issues that, that we've had. So we continue to do them in person, even though they're, they're never well attended. <laughs> Um, but we also did some new types of outreach. One, we started sending postcards. In the past, we had sent, you know, typical government letters, looks like a bulk mailing. Most people like me throw them in the trash before even opening them. It's clearly just a bulk thing. Um, so we changed that. There's no envelope to open. They're brightly colored. They're hopefully will catch your attention at least. You might take a look at it before you toss it in the trash. Um, they seem to have been very effective. In 2016, we did five separate mailings to over 38,000 addresses, um, and people did read them. They would call us. We would get, you know, bumps in calls and emails and questions when our postcards would go out. Also, this was definitely new. <laughs> we started using um, some friendly graphics to help explain um, Asian giant, horn, excuse me, gypsy moth. I have Asian giant hornet on the brain, if you can't tell. But um, so we have our 13 reasons to unfriend the gypsy moth infographic. And that was also incorporated into a new educational video that we did. Um, when I started, they had an educational video, but it's from 1992. And it started out saying, you know, meet the monster, dun, 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 with this scary music. And I immediately started laughing hysterically and said, okay, we, it's time to update this video. <laughs> so uh, we now have a new video. It's kind of long, but it's like 10 minutes, which is long for, you know, watching a video online. Normally I would show it, but, or a part of it, but um, have limited time today. But you can watch that video on our YouTube channel. Um, WSDA GOV is the, our YouTube username. So go there and all things Gypsy Moth and Asian Giant Hornet and all of that will, are there. Um, so all of that was incorporated. And I knew this was successful when we had one of our open houses and someone brought their children with them 
they sat down and watched the video and then came up to me drawing pictures of the bad gypsy moth caterpillar and was telling me why it was bad. I said, yeah, if I can get a little child <laughs> to understand why gypsy moths are bad and why we're doing what we're doing, um, that's a major success. Uh, other new outreach tools that we use, we have a Gypsy Moth Listserv, which is a, you know email group where people can sign up and get information ongoing about the project as we have new developments, um, and also get information about when we are conducting treatments. Also, robocall and text messaging to let people know when treatments are happening. Because they are so weather dependent, we usually don't know um, at most like two days in advance that we're planning to spray, and then early in the morning, you know, it still can be a roll of the dice depending upon whether there's fog, et cetera. So having that way to connect with people with the robocalls and the text messaging to let them know on short notice um, has been really effective. We also do virtual open houses, just like this meeting that we're having today. For people that couldn't make an in-person open house, we basically have the same thing available online. And those have been really popular and by far our most well attended open house because you know hundreds of people have viewed it by the time that um, eradications actually take place compared to you know maybe a dozen people that show up for our in person open houses. A new thing that we've started doing is an eradication Facebook group, and this is a limited duration Facebook group that people can join and get notifications about um, what's happening with the gypsy moth project as well as uh, when treatments are happening. And then another sort of lesson learned, we stole this one from Oregon, where they had put out basically like election type signs um, that are uh, in areas of parks where people might go for a run. So for example, um, so if people might live outside of a treatment area, but they would go to a park that's in the treatment area and go for a run, this would help get them notification as well. So I said I was going to talk more about social media. Um, I'm all about the social media when it comes to communicating with the public. And it was a scary proposition for the agency to go out and say on social media that we are planning to spray Seattle and Tacoma with a pesticide, and here's why. But we did it. <laughs> some of the things that we did, um, we started some proactive stuff. So we had hashtag Gypsy Moth Monday, where every Monday we would put out just little bite-sized pieces of information about gypsy moths. Um, we did blogs. We had, again, our Facebook group info where we were pushing information. And then we had a lot of responsive work that um, my boss didn't know I was doing, I think, until <laughs> right up to eradication. But I would monitor for the term gypsy moth on on Facebook and would go in and comment, not on like per people's personal pages that posted, but if it was a news story, for example, and they ran a story about our gypsy moth eradication, I would go in there and comment on uh, or respond to the comments that people were making about that story. This was really useful because as you can imagine, especially at that time, not a lot of people were following the Washington State Department of Agriculture Facebook page. So their chances of them seeing what we posted was um, not good, <laughs> fairly minimal, even though we did some paid promotion. Um, but a lot of people are seeing the stories that the news are putting out. So we would go in there and uh, respond to those questions. And I'll have a couple of examples of that later. Um, we'd like and share positive posts that, that we saw about our project. There are people that um, were very supportive, especially people who have lived with Gypsy Moth in other areas of the country. Um, so helping to so kind of like and boost their post is really beneficial. And then actually responding to people who have genuine questions or criticism of the potential product, um, project. And then again, we were using the real-time Twitter and Facebook updates. I mentioned the fake news before. <laughs> um, so our approach was going along swimmingly. We're doing you know, really well for uh, what we would expect on, on social media, getting the news out there, getting some pushback, but responding to that proactively. And then um, something happened. <laughs> um, Natural News, which has millions of followers, put out a story that we were going to spray Seattle with a GMO pesticide. This caused <laughs> all hell to break loose, and my life became miserable for a couple of weeks. 
um, my own friends who um, were posting this story on social media. And I'm like, come on, I've been talking about this for months. Don't you know, you can ask me about this. Um, so our initial approach was just to ignore it because it didn't initially come from natural news, but once natural news picked it up, then it just went viral. So we ended up, um, I couldn't type the same response about a, you know, a million times responding to people's questions or posts about this um, fake news. Uh, so we ended up doing a blog post and then I could just um, respond with a link, you know, this is inaccurate. Here's a link to our blog with more information um, about this story. So that seemed to be pretty effective and it definitely died down after that. But it was something that we hadn't anticipated and was not um, very much fun to deal with. So I have a lot of these examples, but I cut them down for this presentation because I know I don't have a lot of time. So <laughs> John Robbins says, so turn chickens loose and let them eat them. That's way more healthy. Monsanto's killing us and the planet. Wake up, people. So we responded and said, hi, John. Unfortunately, gypsy moth caterpillars are most frequently found in trees, often at the very tops. This is well out of the range of a chicken. Chicken. This is not a Monsanto product. Learn more at our website. Always direct people back to our website with lots of information. And then John says, how do they get to the treetops? They can't fly there. So. I, I usually have like a one response <laughs> limit, but I responded again, said, uh, hi again, John. Actually, gypsy moth caterpillars crawl up and down trees quite easily. We certainly understand your concern about not dumping poison, which is one of the reasons why we chose BTK. BTK is a naturally occurring soil bacteria, which doesn't pose a threat to humans, pets, birds, bees, or fish. BTK has protein that only caterpillars cannot digest, which causes them to die. We hope you will look into the damage that gypsy moths can cause to the environment and learn more about BTK. We have lots of information and a variety of, from a variety of resources on our website, at our website. And so then John responds, and I, you know, um, one of the surprising things is we're actually able to kind of convert some people over, which I didn't really expect that we would be able to do, but this happened several times. So John then says, thanks for the information. I live in an area where timber is our big industry, well, it used to be. And I understand the devastation that gypsy moth can do if not controlled. They used to come and put little green traps on the lower branches of trees in the area, but I haven't seen any way for a while, any for a while. Thank you for using something safe. And then he goes on his little dry drive. I need something safer than all Monsanto, blah, blah, blah. And the government's killing us and doesn't care. Uh, but at this point, that's not my argument, right? All I want to do is get him to be like, okay, I'm good with BTK. We su su succeeded with that. And we let him think whatever he wants about the other issues. Uh, another example. Catherine says, isn't it going to kill other moths like the, the food birds and bats need, the pollinators of the night? Something's wrong here. So I responded and said, thanks for the question. It will not kill adult moths and butterflies, but it may impact their caterpillars if they are feeding at the same time as the gypsy moth. This is a short term impact as they will repopulate from outside the treatment areas. Without treatment, the gypsy moths would displace our native moths and butterflies. Learn more about the gypsy moth on our website. On our website. And she says, oh, well, thank you. It's a bit concerning. I understand gypsy moths are invasive. I just hope this works the way it's intended and doesn't cause too much damage to the others. Again, violating my one response rule, I said, we chose this product because it has been used for decades and has been proven safe and effective. We've been trapping and treating gypsy moths for over 40 years, preventing them from getting a foothold here. And then Catherine says, wow, okay then, take it away, guys. Here's a Twitter example. So this was after we started treating in Seattle and Alyssa says, did not know they would be spraying for gypsy moths this morning. Woke up thinking a plane was about to crash into the room. Legitimate concern, the plane literally like went over radio towers and then swooped down below the radio towers flying over buildings. Um, so I can see where she would have that concern. So I responded, uh, sorry we scared you Alyssa, you can sign up to know when treatments happen on our website. She says, thank you, just signed up for alerts. And then what happens next to me is absolute gold. She then becomes an advocate for us and says, she does her own post. She did go to our website. She found the video that I mentioned earlier. She says, helpful video about gypsy moth issue and posts that on her own account. So this is now somebody who 
we had upset by waking them up earlier and she didn't know about the gypsy moth treatments. And now she's doing some advocating for us and sharing our information, our good information about gypsy moth control. Um, so that is just like social media gold. What is the result of all of these efforts that we had, especially focusing on our 2016 eradication, 10,000 acres, Seattle and Tacoma, we had zero protests, no lawsuits, no public records requests, no phone calls to the governor, and no negative editorials in the press. Smashing success, way better than we could ever have hoped for. Um, and this was the result, not just of what was happening in our office with um, our work on social media, but a lot of other agencies that were also helping to spread the message. Um, so <laughs> moving on now to Asian giant hornets. With Asian giant hornets, we have we had basically our gypsy moth playbook that we've been doing for a few years now and tweaking and making you know as things change and adapting it to improve it, make it a little bit better. But when Asian giant hornets came out, you know, this is the first introduction into the United States. We said, okay, we've got a basic playbook to go with, go um, work from, but let's take a step back. What else can we do? How do we have to address this differently? So we came up with um, a very similar game plan, but with, you know, some slight differences. So again, let's talk about briefly, if you haven't heard of the Asian giant hornet, or as we don't call it, the murder hornet, um, you're about to learn a tiny bit about it, but I'm sure that pretty much everybody has heard about it. Um, so Asian giant hornets are apex predators. And the one of the big threats they have is that they can wipe out honeybee colonies within a few hours. So just a handful of Asian giant hornets can wipe out, you know, 30,000 plus honeybees in a matter of hours. Obviously that's a huge risk, not only to our apiary and honey industry, but to agriculture that relies so much on the honeybees for pollination. It also has a human health impact with a, a thing that is more dangerous than that of local bees and wasps. And what I don't think it's emphasized enough is that Asian giant hornets can cause damage directly to crops. So they will eat ripe fruit. So your, your apples, your pears, your grapes, your berries, there's where they are up in Whatcom County. Um, obviously there's a lot of berries. So there's also the direct damage. And then I think about the poor people that are out there harvesting ripe fruit who might upset an Asian giant hornet and then suffer from the previous bullet point and be stung hopefully not multiple times. Carla, you've got five minutes. Thank you. So again, we had to take a look at who is our audience. And when we stepped back, you've got obviously beekeepers, farmers and gardeners, outdoor workers. But we quickly realized really it was anybody who goes outside. Um, <clears throat> and one of the interesting things about this project, unlike um, Gypsy Moth, where we have to convince people that we need to do something, this was a different situation where we had to basically like hold the public back <laughs> from doing their own thing. Um, we had people starting to put out bad information about um, traps and before we could get them good information on how to build their own trap, which does take some research to find out, you know, what's effective and what can reasonably done here in Washington state. Um, we had people already as early as February demanding information on how to make traps. Um, then, as I'd say, the hornet hits the fan in May when the New York Times story runs, uh, I think on May 2nd or so, and uses the term murder hornets. And then what became a Washington phenomenon quickly became a national and international phenomenon with dealing with the media from all over the place, which caused us to have to adapt our language because all of the information that we had out was only intended for Washingtonians, but it didn't say that. So Everybody from all over the country was reporting using our reporting line, which is only meant for people in Washington state as for an example. Um, so we had to change our language. So we made sure to target where people in Washington are supposed to report and where pe other people are supposed to report. Because of COVID-19, we have to do a lot of virtual outreach, which actually played in well to our playbook with the social media that we've been doing for quite a while. Again, we have paid targeted Facebook promotions. The Facebook group is huge. I'm going to talk about that in a second. 
We have a campaign that we started um, with the words that we say most frequently at the Department of Agriculture now, and that is, that is not an Asian giant hornet. <laughs> so hashtag that is not an Asian giant hornet. Um, we have our website and we have started doing virtual press conferences. I've worked here for five years. We've never done one press conference as far as I know. Now we're doing virtual press conferences regularly, and it's been a fantastic way to get information out to the media and the public. I'm gonna talk about this Facebook group really quickly. Um, we have almost 7,000 members in there, and these are the people that really want to know about Asian Giant Hornet. So we can push information there more frequently to people who actually want to know about it. So it's really targeting our audience to people who care. Another great thing about Facebook is that um, Facebook groups is that you'll get an alert when there's a new post in a Facebook group, whereas you won't get that kind of alert just posting to our regular Facebook page. Um, one, I would love to talk about Facebook groups more. If you have questions about it, contact me. Um, but they're a really great resource I have found in working with uh, uh, targeted projects to people who are interested in a certain topic. Um, one caution is make sure you have really clear participation policies so that you can um, remove inappropriate comments when necessary. You have to be really careful, careful about that because of First Amendment rights. Uh, we had fake news again. I couldn't believe it. So first we had one fake sign that was put up uh, purportedly from the Department of Natural Resources. I was really upset because I was like, why would the DNR put this out and not talk to me? And then we realized it was totally not a DNR thing. Somebody just put it up um, in one area of the state. And then in a total other area of the state, a few weeks later, somebody else did it again, except with our information. Um, so these signs had misinformation on them and was something that we had to do and uh, deal with. And how do we deal with it? We took the sign, we put a big fake across it and posted it on our social media, letting people know that was not correct information. Another thing that's really been huge for Asian Giant Hornet is feeding the media. They are like, um, no offense to any media that's on here, but it's a little bit like dealing with a small child. I, I want it, I want it, I want it now. Um, we have, very limited staff. I'm, I'm the social media manager and the photographer and the videographer and um, I work with other programs in Asian Giant Hornet. I'm also the media coordinator. Um, so there's only so much so many hours in a day but we it was really important to quickly get information to the media um, and giving them information that they could use not only the media but anybody who's watching um, good photos, good video that they can use to help tell our story for us. Um, there's only so much reach that the Department of Agriculture is going to have. Normally on our Facebook page, we have, you know, we reach a couple hundred thousand people in a, in a month. Uh, with Asian Giant Hornet, we reach 1.2 million people in a month. With the Seeds from China episode, the one post reached over 32 million people. So um, <laughs> the potential reach is incredible. And you only help yourself and help others by providing that good information, by doing the virtual press conferences, by giving them good photos and videos that they can use to help tell the story. Um, so that when they, when news stories tell the story, if they have visuals, um, they're going to be more likely to run the story, first off. And when they do run it, their story is going to have more reach as opposed to something that's just, you know, a paragraph um, in the paper. So a couple tips there. Okay, getting close to the end. Top three tips, share as much information as early as you can. Um, you know, be as transparent, transparent as possible and get that information out as quickly as possible. You, this is really going to help you build trust with the public that you are telling them the truth. And we even did that with Asian Giant Hornet, you know, try one and try two of tag and track the hornets back to the nest did not work. And we did press conferences on each one of those. And I can tell you, it's not easy to get up in front of the press and say, well, we tried something and it didn't work, especially when the whole world is watching you. Um, but we got so much positive feedback from people saying, um, you know, thank you for being transparent. Thank you for sharing this information. Um, next, be active and responsive on social media. I know this is a real challenge for um, especially smaller organizations, but it has such a benefit that if there's any way, and by the way, this is not like I hire somebody out of college to, you know, be the intern to, you know, try and boost our social media stuff. You need somebody who is on it and um, knows your organization, who knows how to communicate 
positively with the public and otherwise you can create a worse mess <laughs> on your hands nothing against college interns but i'm just saying this is a real skill set that can greatly benefit your agency if you start to participate in it to the level that you can everybody has um, a different capacity but start to engage and that's really the key here engage with the public don't just post if you post people ask questions answer the questions um, even if it's not popular and then my final thing is let people into your, let the public especially, into your world and allow them to be part of and tell your story. So, well, you know, our quote unquote moon suits that we have here, our Asian giant hornet suits, hugely popular. I mean, we have people doing Halloween costumes and that kind of thing. It looks totally silly. Um, but putting that information out there and letting them see what you're actually doing Let them know you have a reason for what you're doing. You are working hard. These people are researching this and doing, making educated decisions on how they do integrated pest management. Um, let, let them see that. It will really benefit you in the end. People will feel invested in what, um, what you are doing like they have been, especially with Asian Giant Hornet. And just one last shout out. I know Asian Giant Hornet has sort of you know, taken over the world this, <laughs> this year. Um, in fact, kind of funny, but after we finally got to an nest, to a nest and eradicated it, eradicated it, um, we had several comments on social media that were like, well, WSDA should apparently rule a the country. They're the only a government agency that gets something done. So it was, it was pretty funny and, you know, it was heartening to see those kinds of comments. Um, but even though Asian giant hornets has taken over, you know, the lives of many of us at WSDA this year. I have also noticed that there's greater awareness around all invasive species, especially, you know, looking back to that seeds from China thing, people were getting that you could introduce um, invasive weeds, you could introduce pests on those seeds that are coming over. We're getting more and more people reporting things, asking, what is this? Should it be here? Just from the Department of Agriculture. So I assume that it's going to transfer to other people as well. There's a greater awareness of invasive species right now in the American consciousness. And I would take advantage of that if I were you. My, my contact information is down below. Feel free to contact me. And of course, follow us on social media. Thanks.